So I'd like to welcome you all, welcome you all here. You learned this morning the procedure that we're going to follow. We have 12 minutes of speech, followed by three minutes of questions, followed by two minutes to move to another room or to stay. Thank you. Our first speaker is Mr. Josh Modest. He completed his research in Townsville, Australia with Dr. Peter Cowman. And his research is, he focused on dysfunctional family trees, dissolving conflicts in evolutionary relationships of corals and reef associated fish. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as Ifa said, my name is Josh Modess. I work at the Urban Assembly School for Global Commerce in Harlem, New York. Um, and this uh, past summer, I got to do a six-week long research experience in Australia, um, which was which was really dope, and I'll share with you. Um, so uh, a lot is known about the terrestrial world, but we're still finding out a lot about the marine world. Um, the Great Barrier Reef on the east coast of Australia is famous for its dynamic ecosystems of vibrantly colored fish, corals, plants, and countless other marine, um, marine organisms. As we know, uh, the Great Barrier Reef is uh, currently being affected by drastic changes in climate, leading to um, a lot of our corals dying due to, due to bleaching events. Not only do, uh, do these bleaching events affect the corals, but they're also affecting um, the dynamic relationships between fish, plants, um, and other uh, species within these ecosystems. Um, there is being a lot done to try to help preserve the corals, uh, like uh, acts of sustainability, like in Australia, there's um, a reduced use of plastics, things like that. Some researchers are even going out uh, and replanting certain corals in areas. Um, but based on my research, we're finding out that we don't even know what corals are there. Um, so it's really hard for us to determine which corals we need to, we need to re replant back into the reef. Um, so my talk has three objectives for today. Uh, we're going to talk about the traditional taxonomy and classification of Acropora. Um, talk about the sample collection, preservation, and um, preparation for the museum. And we'll talk a little bit about how I uh, use DNA sequencing to build um, some phylogenetic trees for these coral species. So my work uh, began at the Museum of Tropical Queensland in Townsville, Australia. Uh, it's actually the second largest collection of corals in the world, second to the Smithsonian. Um, and in this museum, there are a wide variety of um, collections of corals, including many holotypes, which are the first described examples of certain species. Um, the genus that I'm going to be talking about is called Acropora. Acropora is the most dominant uh, coral species found in reefs due to their growth structure. Um, they kind of look like little trees. They're also known as staghorn corals because uh, they kind of look like the horn of, uh, of deer. Um, and the growth form is super important in helping us identify the, the types of corals that they are. Unfortunately, this first described um, species of this coral is a drawing, so it's really hard to tell the, the specific um, morphological characteristics that are usually used in, in classifying these corals. So let's talk a little bit about the, the morphology that's important in these corals. So obviously, the, the way that they grow is going to tell us a lot about what type of coral that is. Um, the shape of these uh, tiny structures called coralites, um, those are really, really informative in helping scientists distinguish between different species of corals that are, that are very similar. Um, and many of the previous phylogenetic trees are based on these morphological characters. Um, so a lot of the, the museum trees and, and a lot of the textbooks are based on looking at these, these physical characteristics. There is a problem with this. Uh, because corals are sessile, they don't move they are often um, subject to the, the conditions of their environment. So we may find one species of coral in one location, um, and in a completely different location, the same species may look completely different. This makes it really messy when we're trying to um, classify and identify species um, using morphological characteristics. So a quick quote here is, um, as they are sessile or have restricted capacity for movement, corals are subjected to environmental conditions at their place of settlement. Consequently, they exhibit considerable morphological plasticity, driven in part by various ecological factors. Um, so typical uh, coral taxonomists will go out and they'll look at these characteristics, but we're finding that a lot of them um, are, are not as um, faithful as, as we wanted them to be. Here's a little bit of the workflow that I went through. So first, um, coral samples were collected from the Great Barrier Reef. Um, a portion of that sample was uh, uh, taken for DNA analysis, which I'll talk about a little bit later and the rest of them were uh, kept and preserved for museum collections. Um, so when the samples came in, they had some tissue on them. There's some uh, symbiotic uh, zooxanthellae on the corals, 
We had to remove that so we can just get to the skeleton. Um, so my coral started off like this and ended up like this. Um, so if I knew cleaning was this fun, I think I would have had less arguments with my mom growing up about washing dishes. Um, what was really cool about this too is we were able to see um, some of the, the ecosystem dynamics within these coral reefs. So here's an example of like a little clam growing uh, in one of the corals, like, um, which, which I thought was really, really interesting. So by the end of the day, I had a stack of really clean, nice corals. Um, and the next thing we had to do was um, take some, some characters on their morphological characteristics. So uh, my job was to become a photographer uh, and uh, take some images of these corals. Um, I imaged them in three basic views, the, a large view, a branching view, and um, some microscopic images of the coralite shapes. Um, and here are some of those images. Um, so based on these features, the, the branching shape, the coral-like structure, um, and the overall growth form, scientists were typically able to, to classify these corals. Um, now let's get into the DNA. So my work then moved on to James Cook University, where my job was to maintain samples, extract DNA, um, and do some bioinformatics with this, with this DNA, um, and eventually use that to build some trees and compare to um, the, the classically accepted trees. Um, so our samples were preserved in ethanol, so one of the first things I had to do because ethanol degrades the tissue was um, change out the ethanol in our, all of our samples and inventory them um, and connect them with the samples that were in the museum. Um, and then we had to do some DNA stuff. Uh, so DNA sequences provide large, num large numbers of phylogenetically informative characters that are independent of the high morphological variability of the coral skeleton. Basically what this is saying is no matter the shape or size of the coral, using DNA we can figure out what it is. Um, so to do this, we needed to assemble some genomes. So we obtained some DNA info from either our own sequence samples or um, samples that were on GenBank. We then had to find some overlaps and um, make some contiguous sequences uh, to, to make our full sequence uh, genome. I compared this a lot to taking a stack of newspapers, shredding it, and then trying to piece it back together. It kind of sounds like counterintuitive, but um, this is kind of the workflow that we go through. Once we have our sequences, we're able to analyze them using um, data viz tools like RStudio um, and another cool tool called Bandage, which will visually show our, our genome sequence and we can kind of identify some differences. Um, another tool that we used was called Genius, which we can use to um, align different uh, genome sequences and compare the differences and similarities. So essentially, the, the more similarities two species have in their genomes, the closer they are on their, on their tree. Um, the more differences, the further they are on the tree. Um, one of the cool tools that I was able to use, um, so some people went to the uh, Illumina facility this morning. So typically, uh, genome sequences are sent to places like Illumina, where it can take sometimes weeks, months to get a genome sequence. Um, this new tool that I was able to use called the Mini Ion, um, you basically load your DNA sample and within 24 to 48 hours you can have a complete genome sequence. Um, so this is something that's coming down the pipeline. Um, they're kind of expensive right now, but what I find really cool is um, in a couple of years we might be able to do this in our classrooms. Um, so uh, once we have our DNA data, we can reconstruct the tree. Phylogenetic trees do give us information about the relationships, but they can also give us a time frame of when these different species were able to diverge. Um, and reconstructing the tree from the nucleotide sequence is the most, uh, most valid, but there is, uh, it is rarely possible to verify the one true conclusion. Um, so here's an example of uh, one of the trees that we were able to come up with. Um, we looked at uh, over three million base pairs. Um, we were able to determine that some species that were once part of Acropora were now removed from, from this genus. Some species that were separate were now brought into this genus due to the, the DNA, uh, the molecular evidence. Um, also, if we're looking at physical characteristics, they can also be subjective sometimes. So we might have three different collectors collect some corals. Based on their view or their uh, experience, they may classify them differently. Using DNA, we're able to um, confirm many of these relationships. Finally, in summary, um, corals of the genus Acropora are really difficult to identify because of their plastic morphology based on their habitat. Molecular data, such as DNA sequencing, provides information that is really important to understanding the coral and fish diversity uh, as a measure of conservation and preservation for the Great Barrier Reef. Um, because of this new information, museum collections have to be updated very constantly um, to make sure that they're most up-to-date with the molecular evidence. 
And finally, uh, molecular data has been the driving force in modern coral taxonomy. Um, together with the application of new techniques to explore subcoral like morphology, new light is still being shed on scleractinian, scleractinian phylogeny. Um, so just want to thank uh, my PIs at James Cook University in Australia um, and the Museum of Tropical Queensland, also the Com Columbia University Summer Research Program for Teachers, including Dr. Sam, Karis, Karen, and Jay. Um, thank you. So um, essentially, coral are, are tiny microscopic um, flagellates, um, but they secrete a, a calcium carbonate skeleton. Um, so they don't, they don't necessarily grow on top of each other. Uh, each coral species has its own um, specific skeleton that it will secrete. Um, and so that's how we were able to, to distinct the different um, species. But don't they grow right next to each other? Yeah, they, they can. And so why don't you get something that allows uh, each one to avoid the other? Yeah, so um, I, I'm guessing like prezygotic and postzygotic barriers will prevent them from, from interbreeding. Mm -hmm. You were ready. That was a great presentation. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, with the, the morphologic plasticity and everything, were those corals that you showed us in that first slide, were they all Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, cool. yeah, so there are many different species of uh, Acropora, um, and, and they can come in many different colors and, and uh, sizes. Um, so that, that first image um, was of a coral reef uh, dominated by Acropora species, yeah. But the ones that you had cleaned? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, those okay, were all yeah, those Acropora. Are very yeah. fun. Okay, mm -hmm. then the other thing is, how were these samples collected? Did you go out and collect them yourself? So I, I didn't get to do any scuba diving out there, yeah, oh, I, I'm not a strong enough swimmer, um, but my PI, uh, he, he was going to different places. They collected them um, right off the coast of where I was from um, Papua New Guinea, Tonga, around the Indo-Pacific region. Um, Very fun. Yeah, it was, it was really Great awesome. Job. My PI actually uh, is also a, a photographer and took, um, took this image on a, on a trip. Um, and this image. Right. Yep. My, yeah, my favorite part was um, the messing up part. So when we, <laughs> when we first uh, tried to sequence our genome on that mini ion, um, it was like a big deal. Uh, like the whole faculty came and, and watched it, um, and it went wrong. And, and that taught us so much more about the process than getting the results. Um, I, I think that was kind of the troubleshooting part, like figuring it out. Um, I think that was, that was really fun for me, actually. Any other questions? Can I add one more? Uh, Katia, I'm going to say. Yes. So you were in a lab at Columbia for two summers, and then going to Australia. What were the differences of like the dynamics or the expectations of what you did? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, my first two years in the program, I uh, did an experience in New York City uh, working with stem cells. Um, so human tissue culture. And then this last summer, I did something completely different, uh, marine science. Uh, it was really interesting, uh, the overlap, like DNA sequencing and DNA extraction is very similar to no matter what organisms you're using. Um, and, and also the, the sense of community based on, on the two different um, kind of uh, study areas, areas of study. Um, coral scientists, they love fish and they love surfing, they love diving. Um, tissue culture scientists, they're kind of a little bit more conservative and like <laughs> clean and, and yeah, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.